health cooperation in a context, and in the larger context of changing world or global order, and present to you a number of ideas which I've been playing with and uh, for the last 10 years or so to see whether they have any traction, any resonance uh, with uh, what you're trying to do in advancing South-South cooperation. And uh, much of what I am going to talk about is in uh, two books, which are actually briefly in the, under the multiplex, The End of American World Order, uh, which is uh, published 2014 and, uh, by Polity Press in Cambridge and uh, republished this year, and Constructing Global Order, which is just published by Cambridge this year, a couple of months ago. Some further details you can find much of that there, but also I have a policy relevant paper which I gave it to um, Dr. Sachin to circulate, and you can also find it in a journal called Ethics and Internal Affairs. First, where, how did we come here to the 21st, 20th century world and our 21st century world? So many of you have heard about the great divergence. Uh, the, many of you, many of us take the rise of the West for granted but it's a very short span of, in human history. So in the 18th century, China and India were the largest economies of the world. And uh, it's, so it's not even 500 years, it's 300 years or less since China and India went down with the rise of Europe, imperialism and colonialism. And uh, at the end of the Second World War, China and India had fallen quite drastically. And uh, during the time, the United States and the European countries plus Japan had taken off. So again, none of this data is perfect, but this is from Angus Madison, which is probably the most widely accepted data set on long-term global trends and economy. Now, of course, uh, countries like China and India are rising. But I want to make a very important point that it's not just China and India, and it's not just the BRICS. We give too much emphasis on BRICS and G20. The global south as a whole is uh, rising. So um, I have uh, done a lot of uh, number crunching, not myself, but actually surveyed a lot of uh, data, databases on this. And uh, I think what I'm presenting to you, which is also developed more clearly in my book, is uh, what I consider as the consensus uh, data or trends that the global south or the developing countries will account for close to 60% of the global GDP by 2030. And uh, by 2030, rise of China and India will probably account for 35% of global GDP, if not more. And uh, also, if you look at the, how the tide is turning for the last, uh, uh, say, since the Chinese reforms actually started, followed by India's reforms, so look at the U.S.-China share of global GDP. In 2001, U.S. had 32% of the global GDP. China had only 4%. So U.S. share, America's share was uh, almost eight times that of China. In 2014, the United States had fallen to 22.3%. China had risen to 13.4%. So U.S. share of the GDP was only 1.7 times that of China. Now, again, take all this data with a pinch of salt because uh, they can vary. But generally, there is no question about where the world is heading. And you, many of you are economists here, and uh, you would know much better, much more specific uh, information on this. But I think uh, based on, I have surveyed a whole range of data, including UN data as well, and I find that uh, this is to me, unless something really dramatic happens, we see not only the rising powers of four or five countries or 20 uh, nations, but the rise of the global south in general. So the five largest economies uh, in terms of share in glo of global GDP could be China, the United States, the European Union, India, Japan, and uh, again, China and India could account for 35% of the world's GDP, which would restore them to their position at the beginning of the 18th century. So it's not really new in the larger scale of history. Okay, uh, moving on. What does this mean for world order? So this power shift we are looking at, what does it mean for world order? Well, uh, to put it very crudely in a stylized way, the post-World uh, War II period, 
Uh, many people call it bipolar, but it's a misnomer. Really, there was a very unipolar. The Soviet Union was only important in a military strategic and to some extent ideological sense. But overall, preponderance of power laid with the United States. And it was the United States that shaped institutions of multilateralism and uh, also, uh, including the big multilaterals, the UN system, and also had a tremendous influence on uh, the foreign policies of states and regions, uh, including non-state actors, by the way. Many of the uh, non-state actors, even though they challenged the authority of governments, including that of the United States, but the large, big NGOs came mainly fra from the United States or were backed by the West, and also corporations, which are also, I consider, as non-state actors. Uh, they were also dominated by the United States. So the United States has this overarching dominance, where some people call it American primacy, some people call it American hegemony, or uh, the liberal order, liberal hegemonic order, which uh, much, uh, is much in the news these days for its decline and, 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 uh, and possibly end. Today's world, as we see, is very different, looking increasingly different. And that world um, <clears throat> has the uh, United States as a key player, but uh, not in the hegemonic position. We had the old powers, including the European powers like uh, France, Britain, and Germany, United States, but we also have rising powers like China, India, and the BRICS countries in general. But they do not control the world in the way the United States control the world. So they have a small portion, the small uh, semicircle you see. They are important. The world is still hierarchical. I don't believe the world is flat. We're going to see a very equal world. Uh, it's going to be hierarchical. But the nature of that hierarchy is going to change. And uh, we have more space for institutions and multilateralism. And I'll come to that in a moment. These are not going to be the same institutions and multilateral, multilateralism that we had after World War II. There will be new institutions, new forms of multilateralism, very, very different than the <coughs> last uh, 70, 60 years or so. And then we have nations and regions and non-state actors playing an increasingly important role and impact a foundational role in the global order. So I call it the multiplex world. So you will see this is a slightly different representation of the previous chart. You see a lot of linkages. It's a complicated, complex picture. It's not straight unipolarity or hegemony or bipolarity. It's not even multipolarity. In fact, I discard the term multipolarity, and I'll tell you in a moment. What I call the multiplex world, or NG, MGO, which uh, <coughs> kind of rhymes nicely with a lot of uh, development concepts. It's a world without a hegemon. There will be no dominant power in the way Britain and then the United States were. Culturally, politically diverse. Diversity is not going to go away. The world is not going to be flat. Uh, we will have strong diversity uh, among countries, among regions, but at the same time, functionally interdependent. Interdependence is not going to go away either. And interdependence, if anything, is much more complex than it was in the pre-Second World War period. Today, we have interdependence not just in trade, but finance, production networks, supply chains, and global issues like climate change. That's not going to go away. The main players will not be just states, both the makers and breakers, but also, or not just even great powers, but also, non-state groups, corporations, people's movements, especially empowered by social media, and where cooperation will occur along multiple but cross-cutting layers and issues. So it's, I, I liken it to a multiplex cinema, which, where, which gives this audience a choice of uh, several movies, several actors, directors, producers, and, and, and plots, rather than going to the old days, 1950s or 60s, single movie theater, wait for a movie to go away, finish its run to see a new movie. It's more like a multiplex theater or Netflix or streaming. You have the audience have a lot more choices of uh, who are the actors, who are the producers, and who are the, what are the plots. There is no return to traditional multipolarity. Multipolarity only talks about the distribution of power, how many good big actors are there. But it doesn't talk about the quality of the relationship among them. So multipolarity is one element of multiplex. Multiplex is a much more overarching concept where you have the quality of relationship, interdependence, the types of actors is not just great powers, as in multipolarity, but also a variety of non-state and other actors. 
Uh, <coughs> as I mentioned, no global hegemony, persisting cultural and political diversity, and global governance, which is about multilateral institutions, is much more fragmented. It's already happened, by the way. Well before Trump, multilateralism has been fragmenting. The UN and the big multilaterals are not the only game in town. And we have done a lot, I have done a lot of studies myself on this to see very complex processes, regional organizations, for example, but also corporations like Gates Foundation in global health, public private partnerships, or triangular relationships uh, uh, among different countries but also among different types of actors, not just among uh, governments. That is already happening for the last 30 years or so, especially in issues like climate change and human rights. Globalization is likely to be less led by uh, West, as it has been for the past 200 or 300 years, but more by the rest. And uh, there, may be, uh, there may be a greater focus on a more equitable, just world, but I'm not so sure. So the multiplex world will look like this with terms of actors. You have new institutions like the BRICS or groups and G20. You have uh, the United Nations. You have uh, regional organizations and interregional relationships. You have private actors or corporations. Uh, and then you will also have uh, issues like climate change. You have uh, terrorists and, and refugees and migration. It's going to be very messy and unclear. Uh, complexity is going to be the name of the game. And uh, more on justice and uh, multiplex, uh, this, this issue of uh, ethics and international affairs, they put together an article of mine after liberal hegemony with Amartya Sen's ethics and the foundation for global justice. And I think you will see where ethics and global justice will feature in. I have a feeling, despite all the inequality we see today, because of the rise of the rest, the international development agenda, a global governance agenda, will in increasingly have to embrace more and more issues of justice and ethics. So South-South linkages in this world, many po trends point to the importance of South-South linkages. For example, South-South trade in goods, which is now over a quarter of the total goods uh, <coughs> flows. Uh, not manufacturing I'm talking about here, not services. Uh, South-South FDI flows now are about a third of global flows. And this is UNCTAD data. The largest outward investing economies in 2015 were Brazil, China, Hong Kong, of course, part of China, India, Republic of Korea, Malaysia, Mexico, Singapore, South Africa, and uh, Taiwan. 2015, multinational enterprise, this is investment from developing Asia became the world's largest investing group for the first time, accounting for a th almost a third of the total. Investments by Chinese multinational enterprises grew faster than inflows into China, reaching a new high of 116 billion in 2015. And China spends more on economic infrastructure annually than North America and Western Europe combined. So what it means is that uh, globalization, despite the concerns expressed after Trump, Trump's election, is not going to be to die or go away. It will just take a different form and different phase. It will be led by multiple actors, including such China and India, not just the West, more based more on South-South linkages rather than traditional North-North or North-South linkages, less political conditionality, uh, especially when these actors like China and uh, India become more important in the global uh, investment uh, scenario. Broader agenda, it will focus more on development. To me, infrastructure is part of development as opposed to trade, although all are linked. And, uh, and I am hoping that it will be less coercive. It will not be free, free from conflicts, nothing ever is, but it will not be unlike the scale of the past European or American use of force. Globalization came on the back of imperialism, in case you have forgotten. Uh, I, I, I'm sure you haven't. And it was fairly coercive in, the, in its foundation. And we're hoping that uh, with the rise of the rest, that element of coercion will decline. What about the leadership? People talk about uh, G7, G8, G1, G2, G20, G77, you all know that. But there are people also, Western academics and policy analysts talk about a G0 world. Because the United States is declining, leadership, uh, there's a leadership vacuum. Uh, people like Ian Bremer, for example, talk about. I actually think we'll see what it's called a G plus world. Because of the no number of actors proliferating, number of issue areas, proliferating, we will see very complex forms of cooperation and leadership at different levels, 
uh, and also regional, local, global level, interregional level, and also on depending on issue areas. No country is going to lead in every issue area. So the European Union leads in the climate change. We know that. The United States still will be a big leader in military affairs, strategic affairs. China will have increasing importance, leadership in uh, economic and especially certain aspects of development agenda. So we will see also leadership at the regional level. Uh, you cannot think about leadership in Southeast Asia without ASEAN, uh, because ASEAN plays a very important role despite all of the problems it's facing today. So leadership will be entrepreneurial, intellectual, structural, and also normative. So what I would now conclude with is uh, what I call idea shift. We have talked about power shift. Everybody talks about changing GDP. I started by talking about that, how the GDP structure, the share of global uh, GDP is changing. But we don't talk about corresponding shift in ideas. We still think most of the good ideas come from the West. And the rest basically follows with some tinkering. Sometimes good people from the global south propose good ideas, like Amartya Sen on uh, Mahabub al on uh, human development, Francis Deng on responsible sovereignty.